All right, so we're reading book three, Sutra 15. The succession of these different phases is the cause of differences and stages of evolution. There is no description. So what Gyanasvara says, changing the sequence of the characteristics is the cause for the different appearances of results, consequences, or effects. There is a natural flow or trans transformation in all levels of nature whether in gross or subtle planes of reality. These transitions are the foundations of the principle of cause, yielding effect. Some of these are known at the surface level by all of us. The subtler transitions are known to the yogis. Recall that one of the foundation principles of yoga is non-attachment. Also recall, this is a process that evolves in stages and that here in this section, we are talking about extremely subtle processes. Though the processes are subtle, the principles are the same. You witness, notice an underlying reality, and let go of a more surface attachment. A particular form comes from the sequence of states. Imagine that you are able to meditate so quietly that you recognize that all of the objects of your attachment were simply a result of a change of sequence in states. For example, clay turns into pot while remaining clay and then eventually turns back into clay. So it is with all of the objects, whether objects in the external world or objects in the mind, it is all a matter of changing form or the sequence in which those forms are seen. Gradually, the unchanging truth is revealed underneath all the apparent change in successions of transformations of that uniform oneness. I'm gonna keep reading. Uh, sutra 16. In this and in the following sutras, Pantanjali describes various samyamas and the cities or psychic powers which will result. And again, as far as says, by samyama on the threefold changes in form, time, and characteristics, there comes knowledge of the past and future. Witnessing transitions tells the past and future. If you know the current state of the transformations related to form, time, and characteristics, then you also have an understanding of the past from which they evolved and the future towards which they are evolving. The question is the degree to which you have clarity about the current moment of these three. Imagine a pot of boiling water. Imagine that you put a pot of cold water on the stove and you wondered how long it would take to come to a boil if you knew the nature of the current form, the time factors, and the characteristics you were dealing with, you could calculate an answer. Of course, the principle of samyama is much subtler. If you knew the exact temperature of the water, the BTUs of heat from the fire, the barometric pressure, the heat conductivity of the pot, and other such factors, you'd be able to calculate when the water would boil, presuming you understood the formulas. Letting go of the subtle abilities. This sutra is the first of many in chapter three that describe attainments, abilities, or powers that come with practices. The wise yogi does not seek out such powers, but recognizes that they come along the way. Where they are encountered, their value is in uncovering the potential colorings of attraction and aversion and the avidyas, so that these can be set aside in non-attachment. Sutra 338 clearly points out the principle of renouncing such powers. Can I keep going? I think everyone's muted. Keep going, yeah. So 17. Satunandana says a word, its meaning, and the idea behind it are normally confused because of the superimposition super upon one another. By samyama on the word or sound produced by any being, knowledge of its meaning is obtained. He's intentionally being very vague here, it seems. Um, so Gyanasvara says, 
he gives a description of 17 to 37. Setting aside the subtler experiences, there are numerous subtle realm experiences that come to the yogi after the finer tool called samyama becomes available. Each of these in their own way is experienced so as to uncover the truth behind the false identities. The suggestion is to set aside as not self all of the levels of our being and all levels of discovery seen through a video or ignorance by a process of discrimination and non-attachment. While some people see the coming of these experiences as powers, city, psychic, or occult abilities to be sought for furtherance of the ego identity, the true yogi sees these as nothing but the subtler clouds of attraction that are impediments to the realization of the self. They are encountered, experienced, understood, and set aside. Reading these sutras on experiences. When reading these sutras, it is important not to feel that you must attain all of these experiences to progress on the path to self-realization. Remember, these experiences and practices are done with the tool of samadhi. Once that skill level is attained, seek the highest. There is a myth circulating that to experience the truth, you must first be completely 100% purified. And that is simply not true. First seek the direct experience of the top of the spiritual mountain, and then learn to purify the subtler aspects. The later house cleaning. Surely there is stabilizing and purifying needed to attain that direct experience, but the final house cleaning is pursued after that realization. For some comfort in this, note that Sutra 427 to 428 gives instructions on dealing with breaches in enlightenment. It means that one is not expected to have completed the process of purifying karma before realization of the highest, and that is good news for aspirants. Okay, so 317, the name associated with an object, the object itself implied by that name, and the conceptual existence of the object, all three usually interpenetrate or commingle with one another. By Samyama on the distinction between these three, the meaning of the sounds made by all beings becomes available. Three kinds of table. The sutra speaks of three things, the name associated with the object, the object itself implied by that name, and the conceptual existence of the object. To understand this, think of a table, and you will see that there are three parts. Syllables. If you did not know English, you would hear the syllables of table spoken but neither an image or a concept would come to mind. All there would be for you is the sound. Number two, specific table. If you think of some specific table you know of, that table can be in your memory without the need for syllables. If you had never seen a table and did not know what it was used for, the concept of tableness would not be there either. Three, tableness. The third part is that there is a concept of tableness that can exist without the syllables and without thinking of a specific table. In any language, the word for table would bring forward tableness for those who know that language. The principle of tableness is there with all specific tables you might think of or see. The three parts of table converge. However, in day-to-day -day usage, all three of these converge into one unified experience of table. In this experience, however, the yogi wants to go far beyond the world of appearances. In the practice of the sutra, the samyama is directed towards distinguishing these three. From that samyama, greater, subtler insight is attained. Sound vibration is subtle reality. Many meditative traditions and spiritual traditions speak of the fundamental vibrations of the subtle and causal planes of reality as being sound vibrations, word, or mantra. Here in the sutra, the instruction is that by discriminating between these three parts, the subtle sound is revealed. And through that revelation, the meaning of the sound is attained. Mantra. One very practical example of the relationship between name, object and conceptual existence is that of mantra. With mantra, one starts with the word or phrase itself, allowing the others to gradually become revealed. One might have a definition of sorts, but the real meaning comes in direct experience. Then comes the clarity of the distinction, as the subtler spiritual significance of the mantra stands alone. 
A most significant use of mantra was explained earlier in relation to Om Mantra. I guess we'll get into all the other ones on a later date. Or I could keep reading about all the psychic powers, just everybody's going to miss them. I know this is like such an interesting chapter. I want to keep going. I don't know. Or we could talk about it. <laughs> you guys have to unmute yourselves. They change Zoom. Um, I don't know what to say. No, I don't, I don't, we can discuss it or we can go keep going. I don't know. Any other thoughts? Nobody knows what to say about the tableness of table. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll keep going. I know you're not supposed to be interested in this stuff, but this stuff is always so interesting to me. It always has been. Uh, okay, so through the direct perception of the latent impressions, samskaras comes to the knowledge of previous incarnations. Samskaras lead to karma. The samskaras originally led to our karma. The samskaras are the latent impressions or conditionings that we hold in the subconscious mind. And because of this, the yogi wants to examine and eventually eliminate those samskaras. Past life regression can create further bondage. To a typical person seeking past life regression, there is a seeking out of a replay of the inner mind field. So as to increase knowledge about ourselves, this is the coming through into the conscious state of the inner process from the subtle mind. It can have the effect of increasing ego and ignorance as it leads one to think that these past memories are part of our self-definition. In effect, bondage of ignorance is increasing, not decreasing. Samyama on the samskaras brings freedom. However, to the yogi doing samyama, on these deeper samskaras themselves, the deep impressions, there comes increasing clarity about the way these samskaras had clouded the self-identity and obscured self-realization. Thus, these past identities are not reinforced, but are attenuated and set aside. They are not seen as self-identities, but incorrectly perceived false identities. This leads to lesser bondage and greater freedom. As with the other subtle experiences, this is seen to be both an attainment and an obstacle, and is set aside with non-attachment. My teachers always talk about that, how you're not supposed to go to like psychics who tell you about your past, and um, you're not supposed to do any past life regressions. Like my teacher got in trouble when he was in the ashram because they found some regressionists who came like secretly, the, all the swamis went to go see the regressionists and they got in big trouble. They weren't supposed to do that. And I guess this is why, because it's not important. That's what they, you know, when, when they're not explaining why it's not important, you're like, but it seems important. <laughs> they're always like, no, it's not important. This is not important. Like none of the cities are important. Just glaze over them, but you're like, but. They're so crazy, like, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I get the point of this. It's like every past life you had was another, it was another false identity. That makes sense. I just rewatched, um, cause my favorite movie is Back to the Future part two and Eric and I were bored on vacation. We, watched, we tried to watch all three, but it makes me think of like when, I don't know if you guys have seen these movies, but when they travel backwards and forwards, it's like if they run into their old self, if they make eye contact, the whole world can like be destroyed. So it's like, if we do that with our, I'm thinking about that, like if we go into our like reincarnated selves and start learning about ourselves, then going to implode the whole world. <laughs> that's very funny. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah. I, I think about those movies all the time because, like, I, I believe time isn't real. Like, like, that thing could be happening at this time. Like, time is such a weird concept to me. And as a math person, like, the numbers have, t and this is before I didn't realize time or understand time wasn't real. And it's been such a simple explanation for me like a relief to 
And I'm like, yes, that's why I don't understand it. But like the forwards and backwards of like time to, of um, time zone, like the fact that it's already tomorrow in some countries is like, or that like something happening here, it ha like they're still sleeping there. Like it's just, and like, so if that, if that's true, then how can it not be true that like years are like, to me, it's like, it could be like forward and backwards, like even with back to the future type stuff. But yeah. I mean, I'm not like saying it to like stir the pot. I'm just saying it because it makes me relax a little bit about time, but I have a hard time with, <laughs> with time. That's an interesting mind stretch. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, it drives me, it drives, time drives me crazy. Like, it's hard for me to calculate when I'm somewhere else, the time difference. I'm grateful for my phone because it has that world clock now and I can be like, this is where I am and this is where I need to know the time. It may sound silly to you, but when I, I do a lot of global events at work, so I'm constantly like, what time is it in Italy or what time is it in California or what time is it in, and especially even in the US, some states don't do the time change when we do. So I'm like, what time is it in Arizona? What time? So like, I'm always like, and I'll get confused. I'll be, I'll think California's forward three hours, but they're behind three hours. So yeah, it's it, the it concept is, of humans, right? It's not real. Yeah. But it, but I will say that it is important because it is a benchmark because we've talked about this with Estea and stealing, like, don't be late. <laughs> like, don't make someone wait for two to three hours right, yeah. for you for dinner. So it is a good benchmark for me. But yeah, oh. so like tying that all together with reincarnation. I mean, I get. I guess I just have to like. I don't necessarily not believe in it or believe in it, but I'm leaning more toward believing in it the more I study. Just because, for me, like the things that come up, like how I can't prove it not to be true. I can prove it more to be true because of things that come up for myself. Yeah. Yeah. The only. Th I think you said something though that, and maybe I misunderstood it. It's one of the like previous sutras, it said something like about the past and the future, like understanding the past and the future to know, to know the present. I don't know, when you said it, it made me think of the, that quote where it's like, we have to understand history so we don't repeat it type of thing. And like, especially with everything that's going on now, I think that's so important not to like, live and dwell in our history but to really learn and understand it so that we can change the, the future by yeah. living more in the present i guess yeah that's a very mac macro view of it i think that's really accurate and important like if we're looking at the collective consciousness and the collective samskaras we have to understand what's happened in order to like interrupt the cycle because if it does if we don't do it now we're just going to come back to the same mess right yeah like because that'll be part of the karma i guess yeah i mean my experience with this city is the same it's like you unlock like oh here's the here it is there's a samskara oh it's happening again or like um i see it starting to play out before it's going to happen and i can interrupt the cycle and it's all through like that ability to be present and look at it it's like you realize it isn't you and that's so powerful when that happens that's when the psychic power happens it's like oh i'm not the conditionings of my mind oh well then here it is playing out i can step out of the situation and it's it's super powerful to be able to do that like something else you said though about time it's like i'm going to take it even further like everything's happening at the same time yeah we think that the future and the past are something different they're not and that's what quantum physics teaches us. And that's what the yogis have been saying for thousands of years. And something happens and you've been meditating a long time where like everything starts getting matched in your experience. It's like you start having these feelings where you know something is coming almost because it's already happening. I don't know how to like describe this, but it really messes with you. <laughs> it's like a really difficult 
thing. I'm like right on the cusp of it. So it's very confusing. You know, this whole, I think we talked about this, right? Like the whole pandemic was coming and I was walking down the street and I was like, everything as we know it will be over. Like I went home and they're like, what? And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like I had a vision, like everything is gonna be over as we know what we have to get food. I have to like plant all the food trees. And then like a couple of days before the fire at the studio, I'm sitting at the dinner table with Mark and I'm like, listen, you know how I had that vision of like all the doom? And I've been talking about the doom. He's like, yeah. I'm like, a part of that was, was everything was on fire. Like everything was on fire <laughs> and he's like okay i'm like i just keep thinking about everything being on fire like maybe it's because they're like putting the buildings on fire with the protester like i don't know i can't get this like i keep feeling like the fire you know and he's like okay <laughs> and then a couple of days later i come to him and i'm like well aaron called me and the studio's on fire <laughs> it's not it's funny it's so crazy. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> it's like it's like you get this like vision of it. it's the weirdest thing i i it well, makes I me felt, not want to meditate sometimes i felt like weird. i was getting some message about the studio but i was it was like remember i was text i was like amanda you need to get wood for the window like i was concerned like i was getting something but it was yeah. like, i'm on i'm like <laughs> on there but it was like a little off but i feel i feel like so that book the secret i don't know if you guys are familiar with it where it's yeah. like you're pulling I guess that's the same thing. It's just marketed a different way where it's like, so like they say like, okay, well, Amanda, you brought it on yourself because you thought about it, but really you're not like, we don't have that kind of power. We're like bringing it. You're just like getting a warning. Like I, I, happen. I couldn't even stop it if I wanted. That's the like most frustrating thing about the whole thing. Like you can feel something coming and you know it's coming and like you'll try to do everything in your power to stop it because you can feel it coming but you can't interfere with fate that's <laughs> cuz it's already happened yes. i try to tell this to women who are like i'm never going to find my lover like where is my lover and i'm like you guys are already here you've already met like you're going to meet when you're going to meet there's nothing you can do to stop it like there's no mistake you can make to stop your fate from happening there's no you like it's like that uh, analogy about the plane. I think Jackie and Pam, you were at my house for that discussion, right? It was like that random workshop. I don't even know how we ended up at my house, but oh, yeah. like fate is like, everybody's on an airplane and we're all going to Bermuda and you can't get off the airplane. There's nothing you can do. You can kind of walk about the cabin and decide what you want to eat and make these little decisions. Like that's what free will is. But like at the end of the day, you're going to Bermuda. And that's a lot of like life. <laughs> that's a lot of life. And like the more you meditate, the more you start to see that. It's like you can't even, yeah, like what you're saying, Pam, like we don't have as much power and control as we think that we do. You just kind of tap into like seeing what is when you do all these yoga practices. It's a real mind F U C K. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I even remember growing up. I didn't have yoga, but like I knew I was going to the college I was going to. Like that was where I was going. And, but I was called stubborn and bossy and whatever other words. And, but that's like where I wanted to go. And like, I couldn't, I couldn't explain the feeling. I just, I saw myself there. Like I couldn't see myself anywhere else. And I didn't even apply there until March of my senior year, but I was never stressed out about it. Like I knew I was going there. Like it wasn't a question. Like I didn't even need to apply to go. I was just going to show up. <laughs> but I, at the time I put it under that, like that secret umbrella because it was like, I like manifested it for myself, but really it was all part of my plan anyway. Like I didn't do anything to like, I was going there because I was planned to go there. Yeah. Yeah. And you incarnate, they say like before you incarnate in the body, you're attracted to all the circumstances you're supposed to experience for the unfurling of your consciousness. So it's like there's this grander thing. And that's, I think what you're saying, like you felt relaxed about it. It's like, this is what's gonna happen. There's nothing I can do. Like, I just, I'm just gonna go with the flow. Like 
there's Ishvara Pranidhana. Like that's what the surrender to the divine means. It doesn't mean like I'm just like laying down and taking it. And it's like, it's happening. It's all happening. There's nothing I can do about it. So I'm just going to like feel peaceful. And that's like, and then people, people with this, I think this is what Ashley was saying. Like, like if you want to get underneath spiritual bypassing, like you have to understand the real essence of things. Like if you actually get that, it could seem like you're just glazing over life and like, oh, well, this is what was supposed to happen to people at this time. And like, it's not like, that's not actually spiritual bypassing. Like if you get the real undercurrent of things, it doesn't mean that like, you're not going to do the work and you're, it means that you were already marching and you were already doing work for civil liberty. You were already like taking part in all those things. It doesn't mean like you're stepping out of whatever work you were supposed to do. It's just mean you were going to do it whether you wanted to or not, you're, <laughs> this is, and that's a hard pill to swallow, right? Like we pick this, this time, here we are, there's nothing we can do about it. Like we were supposed to be here right now. Everything's terrible. I keep going like back and forth of like, I just want to run away, but it's like, oh, you picked it. Like just deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like so many people though are, may, and maybe I'm wrong and maybe I do it myself, but I feel like the times when we resist that, that pull and like try to force something else in, like if I didn't listen to myself about that college and just went to a different college or like people that really think they're supposed to go somewhere and get rejected from something and you're like, it was meant to be. And like, people don't really like hearing that, but it's like true. Like if you get fired from your job, I just had this conversation with someone this week because he's being let go. And I'm like, I can't tell you how many of my friends when Bear collapsed in 2008 uh, and JP Morgan bought them, I went into the most senior people I can find. And I'm like, I do not want to go to JP Morgan. I want the package. And they interviewed us all. And I was the only one that got picked to stay at JP Morgan, even though I was like, I don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> and all my friends went on to like these, um, like they're just so happy where they are even now. And it was hard at the time, but some of them stayed in the industry and some of them went on to do like totally other amazing things. And like, even now they're all so happy. And I'm still like, here I am at JP Morgan. Like I won't leave. And I don't know, like, I don't believe I'm supposed to be there, but maybe I am supposed to be there because I'm the ones that's like shining the light. Like you all people need to be stopped being so greedy and jerks all the time. <laughs> so like I find a few years ago, I came into the, I was like, all right, I either need to stop hating on this place and find gratitude. And I do have a lot of gratitude toward my job now or I need to leave because I can't live like in this flux anymore like I had to accept that I was supposed I hate the word supposed to but that I was going that I'm there but I feel like maybe there's so much unhappiness because people are not listening to themselves they're listening to other people and they're doing things that really like are not their fate like how many people don't date the guy because their friends don't like them and maybe that's the guy for them. And now they've but lost. It what? But it wasn't. If they don't get with that person, it wasn't. Yeah, but they're not listening to themselves because they like them, but the friends don't like them. Right, but that's the center. Like, even the suffering we endure, we are supposed to endure. Oh, boy. That's the center. Like, oh, that's, the, that's the bitter pill. <laughs> when you're, like, sitting. That's been me recently. I'm, like, such a mess. You know, I've, like, been sitting in it, and I'm, like, okay, well, yeah, all right. It's, like, when you're pregnant. No, you know, it's, like, when you're pregnant, you feel, <laughs> like, you're going to be pregnant for a 100 years, and towards the end, you're so big. I couldn't even walk down the street. I couldn't walk down the street. I couldn't go further than a block. I was, like, this is the worst ever. <laughs> and my husband would be, like, nobody's pregnant forever so it was like okay i just have to endure the suffering i endured the like even the day that i was giving labor i'm like this isn't going to be happening tomorrow that's what i kept telling myself like all right just deal with it, it isn't gonna be happening tomorrow like this is your fate you know 
And it's like, I'm, I feel like I'm in that moment. I don't know if anyone else is relating to that. I feel like I'm in that moment right now where it's like, everything sucks. <laughs> but it's not going to suck forever. And it's like a part of our fate to experience the suck. Suck. <laughs> I just saw a commercial for that game, Sorry. Or I don't know where I saw it. You know, where you like, you move forward and then you hit a space and it's like, sorry. I feel like that's... <laughs> To me where I was like going forward and then you were like suffering and now I'm like okay let me go back here <laughs> now I have to go sit with that because now it's like every single thing that happens to you is literally part of the fate right even if you're pushing away your fate that's part of the fate I mean right. that's insane it's that surrender there it is Micheline always says to me, because things get so crazy running a business, and sometimes I'll be like, maybe I'm not supposed to anymore. Maybe this means I'm not supposed to anymore. And she's always so sage about it. She's like, it will become apparent when you are not supposed to anymore. <laughs> <laughs> she always says to me, I'm like, fine, Micheline. And then like the next day, I'll get some kind of sign where it's like, all right, I'll just suck it up and keep going then. <laughs> She's right. It's like so apparent. It's so glaring in your face when like something is done that like it's just done. Yeah. Otherwise, like what I guess what I would say is like what happens if you were to just leave to Vermont like that. So with that or wherever, like say you were to just run away right now, would that be part of fate or would that be like disrupting? Yeah, it would be if you if I actually did it. But like, I guess the world won't let you do it. That's the thing. Like the whole idea of like, I can try to jump out of the plane. Okay. But like in this alternate reality example, like there's no doors. <laughs> you cannot jump out of the plane. <laughs> and I guess you've done all the work to surround yourself with people that are like Michelin. So like that is part of the fate too. So like keep you in part. Yeah, like sometimes at the studio will be there and somebody will walk in that like no one's ever physically met, but we'll be like, oh, hi, there you are. <laughs> like you felt them coming, you know, like, like when you came in, Pam, we were like, oh, there you are. <laughs> like we, we all kind of felt like you were coming, you know, like the people who end up becoming a really big part of the community. It's like, you can feel it the second they walk in. It's almost like a memory. Like you remember them or I something. Felt it. I I had that with Rev too. I mean, I did the one love tour. I live, Revolution Yoga is the closest yoga I can walk to it. It's a mile. And I have tried every other yoga studio and teacher on Long Island before I walked into the studio of Revolution. And the second I walked into that studio, I was like, I'm home. Like, yeah, it's like a weird thing. Two weeks later, I'm signing up for yoga teacher training, which I didn't even know what it was. Like, it was so, it was so so insane but yeah I totally believe that yeah me too and people are always like look what you made I'm like nah you don't understand like if I didn't do it one of us would have done it and we all would have ended up together like there was I'm just like a steward to this situation that we all would have ended up in any way because I came in with some karma that means that like I I didn't want to own a business Talk about being pushed. My, I was going to quit teaching yoga. And then all my students were like, no, no. You have to open a yoga studio. We're going to give you so much money. You're going to do it. And I was like, all right. Okay. I guess I could. And then like my partner six months in is like, oh, you can have the business. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm like, what do you mean? I didn't even want to own a business. <laughs> and it's like 10 years later. And this is why Micheline, I'm always like, Micheline, are you sure I'm supposed to be doing it? She's like, you will become a parent. Just. Just stick it out, you know, like all the time I'm going to Mark, I'm like, I could, we could just get a farm. Like we can go very far away. We could just get a farm with chickens and a cow, I'm like just no internet, you know? And he's like, just, we're staying here, just relax. <laughs> Do the other choices ever get played out? What? Do the other choices ever get played out? Yeah, sometimes you have to like go through a lot of the choices before you realize what the one underneath was. It's always there, glaring. It's like kissing all the frogs before you get the prince. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a great example, Pam. <laughs> that's so funny. I was going to say that like before me and James dated, like I knew that we were going to like be in a relationship. 
and even he was kind of like in denial and like our, my whole family and like all my friends were like you're crazy like <laughs> <laughs> oh james she knew the whole time i know <laughs> I'm well aware. <laughs> and we were like, are you sure? Because it seems like, you know, maybe you're, and she's like, no, we're going to end up. Yeah, Ashley was tuned in. <laughs> yeah, that's like when that, that annoying, cheesy thing when they're like, when you know, you know, like, you're just going to know. Yeah. And like, what does that mean? You know, like, what? How am I going to know? And then when... You know, like I felt Mark's soul. I have this like weird thing where like I feel people before I meet them in physical life. Like I felt him, I was like, oh. And I, I had a millionaire, he might have been a billionaire even. He wanted to date me. And I was like staying at his house in the Hamptons. And, and I was kind of like, I don't know, I don't know. I, I don't know, you know? And then like when Mark, Mark showed up like a week later and I was like, oh, there he is, there you are, you know? And like, and I, the whole time, I was like, no, I'm going to marry him. And I've never been like that with anyone. I was always like, they would propose to me, and I'd be like, no, no, you're not, no, it's not right. <laughs> <laughs> with Mark, it was like, and it didn't even matter. You know, there were things that were, weren't great, and like, you know, still, and like my sister at one point was like, you know, you can just not be with him. And I'm like, I can't. I'm like, it's not my choice. <laughs> no, I'm like, no, I have to, I have to. And like, now I'm looking at the life I have with like Isabella and everything. And like, I look at her and I'm like, well, this is where it was going anyway. Like there was no choice. Like this is, you kind of feel it. It's like a weird thing, right? It's a weird thing. Cause it was always happening. And if you yeah. don't fix, work through whatever now, you're just going to come back to it. Right. You might as well sit and do the work. Right. I think that's what he means by like the whole idea of some yama on the samskaras. It's like you can see what's coming because you know what your impressions are. And like even part of the fate of it is stepping out of the cycle of the impressions. That's like even something that's written into your fate. It's, it's, yeah, it's like exhausting, but it shouldn't be. It should just be relaxing. <laughs> it's what the yogis say, like, just relax. You, Hands off, like you're not in charge. Just relax and go with the flow of things. And I was thinking yeah. that before we started, I'm like, this living in the present is really exhausting. <laughs> but, and then I thought about it, I'm like, that's such a ridiculous thing to say because it should be, that I can let go of all the baggage and all the worry for the future. That's more work. It's just, it's changed because it's so light and freeing. Yeah. Because Honey, this makes, yeah. I'm listening okay. to all the things you're saying, Amanda, and and I before I knew anything about yoga, um, and I'm not really interested in. I wouldn't want to know about my past life, so I'm not not really interested. I've never. I've once gone to a psychic because my friends did it, and I really didn't. It's it's just not. I'm not interested in any of that. But everything that's happened, I, I feel like it's been. Things that, things that have big changes in my life, like going to college or, or my first real job or coming here to America on my own. Um, I didn't really put too much thought into any of it. I just did it. Um, like the first real job that, well, I, I had a bunch of jobs as, as when I was a student, but, and they all led me to the job I had here as well. Um, and they didn't, it wasn't like, I really want to do this. Somebody said, do you want to do this job this summer? And I was like, okay. You know, nobody in my family did. I, I went and worked in a mental hospital when I was 16 years old um, and looked after people who were locked up, you know, <laughs> and nobody in my family would ever have done it. And, and nobody thought that I could do it. But I just did. And so then I then when I was here many, many years later, I ran group homes. But um, like at my first real job after college, I was sitting on a bus going to London to visit my boyfriend at the time. And I was sitting next to a guy who looked over my shoulder and looked at what I was reading and started talking to me about the place that he worked. You should come work here. And he gave me the phone number and I called them up and I went to and my mother from some day I met on a bus. And 
so I worked there for a year and while I was there I had come to visit my sister in America and the people who she had worked for had moved to Connecticut and they called me and said do you want to come work for us I was like yeah why not you know and I wouldn't have met Shay if, I, if they hadn't called me and said do you want to come work for us so it's just I, and I just things just like happens you know there's so many things like that the first the first major job I had here I happened to walk past a sign and went, oh, I could do that. And I walked upstairs that day and, and, and interviewed with them. And that was, you know, that was the first group home job that I got here. It was just, never really tried hard for any of it. It just happened. And I just go with the flow. And I've always felt that that was just laziness, <laughs> you know? Because I, I never really worked all that hard about it. And I'm just like, eh, okay, that'll work. <laughs> you know but you do work hard you work very hard oh I do I I do I, whatever I've chosen whatever I decide to do when I was a waitress I did I you know I 100 110 percent had to be the best waitress you could possibly be you know I mean just whatever I do I try to do the best I can but it's always been each step which seems like a big life move mm -hmm. has just happened like okay <laughs> You Whatever. have a magical thing about you, Jackie. I always think about your life story. I mean, and I my, kind of were like, okay, go with the flow. I used to be like that too. I'm not like And I think, <laughs> I mean, coming to Revolution too, it was Kate had said to me, I was having the stomach problems and Kate had said to me, you should go see Amanda. And that was a big life change for me too, just from coming to see you that first time. Yeah. And then I had been thinking, I'd already been doing yoga. I'd been thinking about doing a yoga teacher's training, but where I was in Long Beach, it would never have worked for me. And then that first meeting with you led me to, to revolution. So everything just rolls into the next thing. Yeah. If we, we just have to ease it. What? Path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, that's what it is. Exactly. And even now where you're saying oh, everything sucks right now, yeah, but it doesn't in some ways. Yeah. And, and we're supposed to, you know, I'm just, I'm just quietly kind of um, thinking, I don't need to, I don't need to be loud about that. I, do, I don't need to be loud about my feelings, but I need to just be, I need to think about what, what do I do next? And so there's things that have come up that I can do something. I can do something like I just said to Pam as we started somebody's just put up a class for us for teachers to join together to to read a book together uh, about being the change and um so yep I'll, I'll jump on that because that's something I want to do and it's and the girl who's facilitating it is a friend of mine so it's going to be great um and there's just been things that have just happened that I'll be able to change the district, I can't believe this, the district is taking on a program called Choose Love. Um, it's a social emotional learning program. I was on the committee last year to decide what we would do and how we would move forward with this. And we decided that this is what we would do. And I'm doing the training for the program right now and it's beautiful. And if everybody really takes it on board, now that'll be the question. Will everybody, will every teacher really take it on board and do it? But if we do, it will be amazing. It'll be truly amazing. Mm. Um, so I'm like volunteered. Oh, I'll be the, I'll be the turnkey person for my building because <laughs> I'll push this on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's really, really beautiful. And there's so much of it ties in. It doesn't mention yoga at all, but it so much of it ties in with yoga philosophy. The program was, was designed by a mother who, whose son died in a Sandy Hook mm -hmm. shooting. And she's made it her life's work since to work. Because she said, if, if we have an angry thought and we can change that angry thought to a loving thought, that'll change the world. And if that shooter had been exposed to that, it would never have happened. Mm. And she's right. And we can do that in a school. We can teach that to children. So I just, I am so pleased that the, 
superintendent in the district has made this decision to go ahead full force with this. That's her priority. You know, her priority is the social emotional well-being of children more than the academics. The academics will happen if you get the social emotional piece right first. Yeah. Um, so we just have to get everybody else on board. Mm. So in amongst all this other stuff, I'm sitting here quite like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. I'll come, Jackie. Yeah, I'm going to lean into Jackie's intuition. <laughs> it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. We just, it's not that we have to sit back and let it happen. We just have to do our own piece, do what we can do. And everybody, if everybody does what they can do, it'll be all right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Mm. All right, we should, 822, we should. Oh boy. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Oh, okay, we'll do alternate nostril breathing. So take your right hand and fold the peace fingers into the center of the palm. Close off your right nostril with your thumb. Inhale through the left. Close off both. And exhale through the right. Inhale through the right. Close off both. Exhale through the left. Inhale through the left. Close off both. Exhale through the right. Inhale through the right. Close off both. Exhale through the left. Inhale through the left. Close off both. Exhale through the right. Inhale through the right. Close off both. Exhale through the left. Inhale through the left. Close off both. Exhale through the right. Inhale through the right. Close off both. Exhale through the left. Keep that a few more times. Finish out the left side. And do a little breath of fire, inhaling all the way and exhaling all the way. <clears throat> Inhale halfway. And you'll take your 30 rounds. Retain the breath. Exhale all the way out. <clears throat> Inhale halfway. Inhale. Retain the breath. Exhale all the way up. Bumblebee, take five. 
Place your hands down on the knees. You can move into your meditation.
Bring the hands to prayer, bowing the head. Namaste. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.